Hi, everyone. I'm Alan, and this is a new episode of the Intelligence Podcast. In this episode, we are going to jump into a chat with Dr. Alex Zavronkov, the mastermind, founder, and CEO of Inselco Medicine. Dr. Zavronkov is literally shaking up the world of drug discovery through his use of revolutionary technologies in generated AI. This is literally bringing us closer to the dream of extending human lifespan. With a background that bridges AI, computer science, and biotechnology, I think that Dr. Zavronkov is in a perfect position to lead the charge in this next-generation approach to healthcare research. Forbes even described him as the scientist that's winning the AI drug discovery race. And in silicon medicine is at the heart of this, using AI to make giant steps towards creating new life-saving drugs, which in turn is accelerating longevity research. Through this chat, we are going to get Dr. Zaurankov's story on why he created Insilico Medicine and why AI is fundamental to the development of the field. We are going to understand more about the importance of the big moves Insilico Medicine is making and even touch on future possibilities and views Dr. Zaurankov has about the future of cryobiology. And this is going to be a fascinating chat. And as usual, if you enjoy this conversation, and if you like the contents I'm posting on this channel, the best way you can support is to subscribe. Thank you for watching. First thing, uh, it's a real honor to have you on this uh, podcast. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, Dr. Zavaronkov. So uh, in 2012, you published a book with a beautiful title, Dating AI, A Guide to Falling in Love with artificial intelligence. This was really at the beginning of the AI revolution. And then one year later, you published a book with an equally intriguing title, but in a completely different subject, what this appears, Ageless Generation. For me personally, as someone who was who is following actually your uh, research and the work you are doing on this subject, it symbolizes your unique position today as a leading figure in both AI and longevity research and industry. What was the spark that made you fall in love with AI longevity research and the play between them? Well, sure. Um, uh, I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, and uh, my first two degrees are in uh, computer science and management of information systems. Uh, I was uh, interested uh, in aging research since my very early years. Uh, since probably age uh, six or something like that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't pursue that line of uh, research right away because um, uh, the area where I was born uh, was not exactly very prosperous and uh, <laughs> I did not uh, um, value biomedical research uh, at the time. So I had to move to Canada and, uh, um, uh, and do my uh, undergrad there. Uh, and um, also work there. Uh, and uh, after I had a pretty successful career in uh, IT uh, with some touch of AI, so I was focused on GPU, uh, GP, GPU, uh, it was uh, graphics processing units. Um, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to aging research because I think that that's the most important uh, uh, aspect of uh, human existence in general, because uh, it's the most altruistic and the most egoistic cause at the same time. Uh, because whatever you do today, uh, whatever objective function you select for yourself um, in terms of you know money accumulation, reputation accumulation, or some other um, uh, kind of uh, objective function, you are unlikely to win in this game <laughs> because it, you, you, you're after reaching your peak, you're going to start uh, losing and uh, you're going to lose it all. Uh, and the only way to extend this beautiful game is to get into aging research and uh, figure out ways to live longer. Uh, also, it's the most uh, altruistic uh, area of um, uh, human existence, because if you develop one drug or any kind of therapy that extends life for anybody on the planet just by one year, you generated uh, 8 billion life years, uh, if, even if you are not uh, counting for that present value. So there is really not that much of uh, thinking that needs to go into the 
uh, objective function uh, to decide that you want to go after uh, aging and longevity. I'm very surprised that so few people globally uh, dedicated their lives to this field because that's the only thing that technically matters. Uh, and um, AI turned out to be a very uh, useful tool for uh, aging research. So it's an all encompassing area that uh, uh, helps many industries, but if you tailor it to um, aging research and specific, specifically uh, biomedical um, drug discovery, uh, it helps you improve the performance of pretty much every area of this um, huge field uh, by quite a bit. And you can also integrate previously disconnected areas uh, of aging research and biomedical drug discovery. Um, so I decided to just focus on that. Uh, I did my grad work at uh, MSU, did my grad work at Johns Hopkins uh, after, uh, uh, after IT. So by biomedicine, uh, by technology, by informatics. Uh, and um, then once uh, deep learning revolution hit, I was pretty prepared Then started a company called Insilico and then branched out a company called Deep Longevity out of Insilico, focusing on biomarkers of aging. Uh, the books you've mentioned are not exactly related to my current work. So um, the first book is more for, for AI, actually, I thought that you know, the probability that we're going to get um, very powerful artificial intelligence uh, technologies uh, in a decade or so um, was very high in 2010. Uh, and I thought that most likely uh, those systems will be trained on text uh, and uh, decided to write a book which uh, actually teaches AI why it shouldn't kill humans <laughs> and why humans are valuable. So it's a book for both uh, AI and humans. Uh, that's why it's written in a slightly weird language, but some people like it. Uh, and uh, The Ageless Generation, it's a book on aging economics. So it's actually a book which uh, postulates that uh, uh, if we do not extend healthy productive longevity in the very near future, um, the major global economy, uh, economies uh, in the developed countries are going to collapse. Uh, because if you look at the, uh, uh, not, um, uh, the national debt and also net present value of the unfunded fiscal imbalance in the US uh, back in 2011, 2012, uh, it was in the range of $13 trillion. Uh, uh, I'm talking about national debt and uh, the um, net present value of uh, unfunded uh, fiscal imbalance was about $300 trillion. So that's, that's huge number is already unsustainable. Uh, and now we see that the accumulation of debt uh, and this increasing fiscal imbalance continues. Um, so we might be already at the point of no return and you might be uh, facing the great uh, debt reset, so to speak, uh, where many of the retirees uh, will have to accept the fact that whatever was owed to them uh, is not going to happen uh, and is not going to materialize. So I think that currently aging research and extending healthy productive longevity is also the most pressing economic need. So we are very likely to get into the state of, uh, of an economic collapse if we do not extend healthy productive longevity just because of very, very basic numbers. So back when I wrote the book, uh, the um, uh, Social Security uh, per capita in the US uh, was approximately um, $13,000, $14,000 a year. Um, Medicare, Medicaid was already crawling closer to uh, 30,000. So we're, so, uh, sorry, sorry uh, 16,000. So together, um, uh, Social Security plus Medicare and Medicaid uh, gives you approximately $30,000 per capita uh, for anyone who reached 65. And uh, the average income in the US at that time was about 40 something thousand dollars. So uh, you cannot, even if you tax uh, um, the average taxpayer 
uh, you know, 50%, you would not be able to sustain people over exactly. 65 just in the same year. Uh, and we've already accumulated a lot of debt and people are getting older. So with age, you have to spend more. And that gives you uh, this vicious economic spiral, down spiral that uh, uh, makes it worse every year. So unfortunately, um, the policymakers back then did not really consider extending productive longevity priority uh, and extending pension age uh, is not exactly very popular um, uh, exactly. you know, decision uh, or policy um, in any economic developed country. We've, we've seen what happened in France, right? Yeah, exactly. They want I mean, France, I, I exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make sense. But uh, um, so because if you leave it to the populace, to, to, to people, they will make uh, very wrong decisions, right? Because they just needed education and ex explanation of why now people live longer and they need to um, extend the retirement age. And at the very least, we need to make them healthier at the end of life because that's where the money uh, is being spent. And otherwise they just, uh, the economy is gonna collapse. Fortunately, people just don't understand that, yeah. I am really interested about this view because there is that, let's say, philosophical approach to why we want to extend human life, but your view is really very realistic and pragmatic. And it's really interesting to explain this to people that there is a real necessity, like economical necessity. And this is this view is kind of relatively rare actually to, to hear in, in that sphere. So I'm really interested about this view. But when you talk and you think about longevity, for you, it's more about increasing the health span. So the life expectancy stays the same, but we are extending the lifespan, the health span, or you think that extending lifespan is also realistic? So I think that uh, our objective function should be focused on lifespan because um, health span extension are uh, is not possible without life lifespan extension and uh, extending lifespan without extending health health span is also very difficult. So they go hand in hand. So I, I, I see that people like to switch to health span nowadays, right? Because, well, for many reasons, uh, scientists who do not see significant results with their drugs in mice, uh, in terms of the overall lifespan, they're saying, oh, but look, the curve looks much better, so we're extending health span. Well, let's focus on that. So that's uh, one reason. Second is it's something that is easier to explain to just Vox Populous, to people who are um, uh, maybe not exactly very familiar or not everybody is super educated. Uh, so it's easier to explain that, look, we're gonna just keep you healthy and then you can drop that. That just doesn't happen, right? So if you are healthy, you usually do not drop that. Exactly. Uh, but it's easier to explain. And uh, um, I think that it's extremely important to focus on lifespan uh, because that's a much more difficult goal to achieve. Uh, but health span comes naturally with lifespan. So it's very difficult to develop a therapy that will keep you alive for additional 10 years and not extend your healthy life. And if you are talking about 20 years, uh, you will have a uh, substantially long, uh, bigger health span dividend uh, from the therapy. So I think that both need to be prioritized, but it really doesn't matter. So just focus on lifespan. Exactly. So, um, so lifespan extending is uh, effectively a, a difficult problem. But before going into some of the details of why this is a difficult problem, um, we talk uh, today about, let's say some scientific back prediction. For instance, Dr. Aubrey de Grey talks about longevity, escape velocity, really like giving some tight um, like duration or delay that we will attain. What's your view on that? Like, can you give a scientific back view of the future? Let's say, when are we going to see our lifespans extended or maybe the generation after us? What's reasonable uh, time uh, period? So I will have to give you two answers. So one answer is how long you should expect to live. Uh, and 
what my real view is on the current uh, rates of uh, scientific progress in this area. So you should expect to live as long as possible. <laughs> Uh, and you should set yourself a very ambitious goal. Maybe if you are um, in your 40s today or 30s, you should try to set the goal for you know 150 at least, right? Because uh, it's a very ambitious number, but it at is. the same time, it should feel achievable because somebody uh, lived to 122 and a half, right? So even if you set it to 123, you it's not ambitious enough right so you are not trying to win the championship here um so if you really want to outperform uh, and you want to take advantage of all the available technologies and uh, try to outperform the longest living human well set it to something like 130 150 right just to be more optimistic about life and more ambitious so trust me it will help your psychology actually so you will uh, be in a better psychological state if you uh, uh, if you think that you are going to live a substantially longer life, and it will kind of make you uh, do a little bit more research and look at uh, what conferences are out there, what people are out there, what publications are out there. Uh, maybe you'll invent something yourself and contribute to the field. So there is um, there are many many arguments for hoping for the best. Right, and also making yourself religiously convinced that that's going to happen, because the best uh, uh, way to convince others is to convince yourself, right? And the best way to 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 actually uh, set a goal is to uh, believe in it. So, uh, second uh, answer is, you know, it's very difficult to uh, make forecasts um, in the <laughs> area where which is so much multidisciplinary and moving so slowly. So the science of longevity and the many, many enabling technologies um, are mo uh, moving very quickly. So now we've seen massive advances in many areas of biomedical sciences. However, industrializing those advances, uh, getting them into human clinical trials, and also getting them into human clinical trials as a comprehensive approach, it is currently impossible. So you can do single agent clinical trials, you can do um, multi-agent clinical trials uh, to some extent, right, with uh, some drugs that are already uh, on the market. Um, but we don't see any mega projects currently in the world where uh, you would see uh, longevity clinical trials and uh, multifactorial longevity uh, uh, clinical trials. So the framework in which we operate in biomedicine is not fit for longevity research. So uh, and the framework is slow. not going to change. Yeah. yeah. So the only way I can see um, uh, dramatic uh, kind of longevity races would be for a select group of individuals uh, with high profiles and high uh, uh, and, and, and substantial ability to execute to step out of the general uh, norms and work on um, a project in the you know I am John Galt uh, type of. Uh, uh, setting, right, where you would step out of the ordinary, ordinary norms, maybe set up uh, a facility somewhere where you could, where, where you could uh, um, experiment and just do this. Unfortunately, uh, those kind of uh, studies require massive amounts of capital. I know because uh, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, to put one drug on the market after you know the target, it would cost you about two, two and a half uh, billion dollars and 10 years, just because you really need to go through a lot of processes to, to achieve that. And the failure rates uh, are pretty high. So 90% failures uh, in regular pharma. And I'm talking about, you know, cancers, um, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, immunology, um, uh, many, many uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, there are not that many advances that push, uh, that push the envelope you know, very far. 
Uh, I mean, immune oncology, of course, is a huge field that uh, made huge advances, and now we see uh, curative results. But uh, it took uh, you know 30 years to get there, and uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. So. Um, for select groups of individuals, I, I know that there are several initiatives where people are trying to think about that, but just it's, it's such a capital intensive play and uh, it's uh, so difficult to organize that uh, um, uh, I don't think that anybody I know is going to be successful in the next uh, you know, 15, 20 years. There are some mega initiatives like, you know, you hear about Altos, you hear about Calico, you hear about a few others, but in reality, like, look, Calico started 2013, uh, just before in silico, right? Where are the drugs? Where are the research papers? Where are the insights, right? So you really don't have any miraculous advances from there. Exactly. There is no phase two drug out there. If you look at yeah if you just just let me finish this one so if you look gotcha. at altos um uh, the ceo of altos uh is the former co-founder of calico right hal baron and uh, he made it very clear that you know when he was at, uh, at calico that he wants to develop drugs uh it's not about aging research so he goes into gsk becomes um uh, the highest paid executive at GSK, right? And by the way, GSK was the largest uh, antiviral um, vendor, uh, well, one of the largest, uh, second largest, I think, globally before COVID and uh, one of the largest vaccine producers. Guess what? After COVID hit, no drug, no vaccine, right? Uh, even after right. COVID. But then he quits and goes into Altos. Well, and now he's saying, oh, we're not an anti-aging com company. We are uh, a biotech. So uh, I would not uh, overestimate the um, expected performance of those projects, right? Those are commercial um, uh, projects. Those projects are focused on uh, uh, therapeutic drug discovery and uh, drug development, uh, or it, it might not be a thera therapeutic in the um, a drug in the uh, you know small molecule type of sense. It could be something else, but. Uh, it's going to be within a traditional route and you shouldn't expect miracles there, right? I mean, there might be, but the probability is very, very low just given the patterns and the people associated with those uh, entities. So I think that, for example, what Ancilico is doing currently, and I don't want to promote it in any way in this context. Um, so we are focusing on dual purpose therapeutics, looking uh, at diseases and aging at the same time. So many of those uh, therapeutics are out there, like for example, rapamycin, it's a uh, very mm -hmm. famous cancer drug, immune suppressant, but a lot of people are taking it for aging uh, to, to uh, live longer. Uh, and um, we saw the, the results in mice, et cetera. We actually still don't understand how it works. It's a great, uh, great drug, but uh, is demonetized, so it's off patent uh, and uh, very difficult to make money on rapamycin. So we're looking for something that's similar in nature, uh, not uh, in the mechanism of action, but uh, in you know, conceptually. So it it would work as a drug, and it would also extend life. Um, and currently, we have over thirty programs. Uh, several of them do follow that dual purpose uh, uh, philosophy. But even if all of them work, I would make a kind of a, an educated guess. Uh, you know, we probably are looking at 20 to 30 percent maximum uh, in the best case scenario in terms of the lifespan incre increase, right? And health span probably would be even lower. So, and it will take uh, you know seven to eight years for some of those drugs to materialize as longevity therapeutics, right? Because after you reach the market um, uh, with a therapeutic and you want to purpose it towards longevity, it will take a while to conduct additional experiments and convince people that your clinical data that you've generated uh, uh, with respect to aging is valid and uh, justifies additional right. research and clinical trials for aging. So. I'm not exactly very optimistic. However, yeah, yeah, so however, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm of course uh, very engaged in 
many of those discussions, right? In terms of, you know, how to uh, do a few races and maybe in um, uh, the areas that uh, are in the, in, in the areas where it's possible. Uh, we're also discussing with several, you know, government bodies uh, to see if we can make um, uh, this dream a reality, right? I'm talking about acceleration of research, exactly. right? So that we can do it faster. So, but I don't yeah. see huge progress there yet. It's a really uh, interesting argument because I think this echoes some of the frustration people talk about when we mention longevity and research like look at clinical trials nothing is moving like it's uh, it will take all of like until i'm i'm dead it will take them to finish those trials so i'm glad you, you're mentioning this now you found it in silicon medicine that you just mentioned and how the activity of the company is different from let's say traditional drug discovery companies or drug companies let's say and is there in in your let's say business line? Is there any way to address these clinical trial or these delays, like huge delays that it takes to release uh, a medicine? So yes, of course. Uh, the way we are different is that we basically started as an algorithm company. So we never intended to develop our own therapeutics. It's just it was not in my plan when I started the company. Um, uh, unfortunately, we actually got into this stage now. Um, so we started with algorithms and uh, um, we were a little bit, well, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. So I was funding the company uh, myself to some extent, right? I didn't take salary till, till 2019. Uh, and um, uh, we got the investors uh, who put very little money comparatively, right, in the company. And uh, it was pretty difficult to get this money over time. Um, so we struggled uh, for a few years, but we had the luxury because of uh, you know this uh, uh, no, no requirement to develop a drug. Um, we had the luxury to actually go end to end. So develop algorithms that uh, span the entire pharmaceutical uh, research and development. So we looked at uh, how uh, Big Pharma is doing that, small biotechs. Uh, we worked with regenerative medicine companies, with uh, fibrosis key opinion leaders, with many, 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 many um, different uh, scientists uh, trying to support them, trying to develop tools that help uh, them move the research uh, forward faster. But then we realized that there is no money in this. <laughs> uh, we developed great, uh, great tools uh, and great vision and understood how this entire process works. It takes a while, right? And even some of the pharmaceutical industry executives or you know, chief science officers do not know every step. They know maybe part of the process. Uh, but we learned uh, you know, quite a bit. And uh, uh, then 2019, we became a software company. So we released the software to the market, started selling software to everybody and got even more experience in pharma. And then uh, in uh, 2020, we decided that we want to create our own pipeline of therapeutic program, uh, programs and started the race, right? So some facts is that from zero to preclinical candidates, so basically preclinical candidate is just one step away from uh, going into human clinical trials, so you've demonstrated efficacy, so that, that safety in animal models. Um, uh, we nominated nine preclinical candidates uh, uh, in 2022, and some preclinical candidates were nominated for novel targets. And my from zero to preclinical candidate, uh, it took me about 18 months. Uh, and for not so novel targets, for targets I think this that, is a uh, re record period in the sphere, I think. Yeah, so I think that uh, I would really like to see somebody else's results, right? Uh, it's just nobody is reporting how many. And what's the role uh, of AI? I know your, your, your research is well known in AI and longevity. Was that based on AI and deep learning? or Yes, yeah, of course. About... So both target discovery and small molecule chemistry. So we focus on the form of generative AI. 
that allows us to generate uh, human synthetic data with the desired properties and also uh, to, to simulate uh, the behavior of biological systems in time uh, and also in the course of disease. And uh, also we use generative uh, approaches to generate small molecules with the desired properties. So basically uh, tell me all the properties you want on a drug uh, give me a target, and we uh, use AI to very rapidly generate uh, small molecules with those desired properties for that specific target. Instead of um, looking for a needle in a haystack, we generate perfect needle from scratch and then just synthesize and test. So this approach allows us to go very, very quickly. So nine preclinical candidates last year, so 2022, and we now have three drugs and clinical trials and human clinical trials. So from the uh, beginning to the uh, you know human clinical trials, it's very fast. Uh, even though the company has been around uh, for you know ten years, we are just doing uh, those therapeutic programs internally for only three years, and uh, that's much 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 faster than traditional approaches. Yeah, this is interesting because I remember you were talking about generative methods early enough in the like in the age of let's say the the lifetime of generative mm. models and now it's the buzzword right like everyone talking about generative and the techniques you used uh, based on generative adversarial networks and others like you you talked about this in your uh, papers and interviews now we all talk about large language models uh, on which uh, uh, ChatGPT is based do you think that this will give another level of, let's say, power in generating such, uh, such drugs, or it's not really uh, relevant? Well, generative AI is going to transform every area of um, uh, you know, human existence. Uh, however, in pharma, this, uh, this is one of the most protected areas, right? <laughs> Uh, so in biotech, so yes, you correctly mentioned that we were talking generative since 2016 when I published my first paper um, on uh, uh, generative adversarial networks for small molecule drug design. And in uh, 2019, we published a big nature biotech paper uh, called uh, that, that had a generative tensorial reinforcement learning uh, system in the abstract, right? So, so that's, that's the system we developed. Uh, so yeah, we are not new to generative nowadays. It's pretty actually sad that it became such a buzzword because uh, yeah. only competitors who have never used generative in their life, right, uh, and had very very little experience in that area, uh, are now suddenly rebranding themselves as generative AI. So I'm like, okay, that's 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 kind of you guys were criticizing me for that and saying that's never gonna work, and now you are, uh, you know, generative somehow. Because um, at that time, I remember like when you were talking about GANs, we were really at that stage where things that we generate were really like low quality and like it was unclear how this can like have this contribution in uh, biopharma. So it was yeah, difficult. But then, that, but then it, yeah, it was difficult for people to see this, but they also didn't understand that, you know, we're not trying to do inference in seconds, right? So we do a lot of reinforcement and uh, uh, you put, uh, you know, 40, 50 generative engines uh, to work uh, for, you know, 72 hours with a reinforcement learning uh, system where you've got very clear reward, where you have, you know, 500 predictive models evaluating the molecules being generated. And guess what? You get to the level of atomic precision, right? So uh, molecular precision. So um, you you can definitely outperform if you you don't need to have snappy, right? So that's what really frustrates me with some of the journal editors, for example, you, uh, they're saying, oh, but well, send us the open source algorithm for, you know, reproducibility and also just open it to everybody. I'm saying, well, guys, it's actually impossible because it's like asking somebody to open up uh, uh, the Windows operating system completely, right, with all the Google Docs. Uh, and making it, uh, so it's not gonna help anybody, right? Because they're not gonna even compile all this. Uh, it's, it's just a, such a, a huge complicated system uh, where this one algorithm that we are you know, benchmarking, for example, in the paper, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny piece, uh, could be like less than half percent of the generative system 
uh, and they just don't understand it, right? So in that time, again, many years ago, when we were um, showing some of those early steps, people also did not understand. But now um, I think generative approaches are helping us at every step of the way. However, um, in pharma, again, whatever, if you, found, if, you, if, if you found a perfect drug today using AI, like you've got an amazing molecule that works perfectly well, well, guess what? The earliest you are going to see a phase two complete is likely to be five years from now, right? Still, you yeah. already have it at hand. Phase two complete five years from now. Why? Because you actually need to go and build the team to do clinical trials. You need to get uh, the money to do that, right? So you need to convince somebody to give you the money. Okay, you, you have a perfect molecule. You got uh, uh, the investors who believe you. Uh, you can get this money fast, but then you actually need to uh, do the enrollment. You need to get the clinical trial sites. You need to uh, create a biomarker. You need to get the regulatory approvals. So actually, so again, regulation is not, uh, is, uh, so the FDA is a very efficient organization. Uh, you know, do not blame the FDA for anything. It's a great, great, great place, right? So they actually uh, already optimized. It's just the uh, operational um, uh, standards for running those clinical trials. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount of work, right? Huge amounts of uh, people, huge amounts of uh, money. And many of those people that you work with, even at contract researchers, you know, 30% of the time they're on vacation or taking sick leaves or et cetera. So, uh, and, and usually it's a committee, right? So you need to get a few people sure. together. So when 30% of the time everybody is on vacation, uh, they, they just cannot work quickly enough. Sorry. Uh, yeah, and this which, is, this yeah. is a reality. What's the way out actually when we talk about this? period like clinical trial this seems as well in change we, like we, we saw some records being set during COVID, right and again albert yeah. burla the ceo of pfizer is kind of my hero now right even though we don't work with pfizer because they have uh, pretty stubborn ai people who you know think that they are better than everybody and uh, they just don't like to uh, collaborate with our group for example uh but um uh for for um, uh, COVID molecules, if you look at how Albert Burla did it personally, it was brilliant, right? So uh, he got the drug and the vaccine within the time of the pandemic, right? So we're talking about right. three years. So for vaccine, yes, they did not invent it. They got it from BioNTech, right? So they got somebody else's technology and very rapidly got it through. Uh, for a molecule, also they did not invent it right away, or they took some uh, molecule that was out there since 2023, uh, uh, sorry, 2003, uh, from um, you know MERS and SARS pandemics, uh, well, not pandemics, but outbreaks, and uh, uh, they did a lot of work, uh, high throughput screening back then, uh, so something worked, right? They knew the target is good. We also have a molecule against the same target, but we are in phase one. And this guy is, uh, managed to combine it with another drug to ensure that it can be orally available uh, and uh, went after really rapid clinical trials, uh, you know, mobilized everybody, mobilized the government, got it approved within, I think, what, two years, right, from uh, the start of the program. So this is probably the world's record that you, you are looking at. But again, you already have the molecule that works. You have uh, unlimited resources, and you have the ultra dedicated CEO. Will he do it for something else like this? Probably not, right? Because outside of the pandemic uh, context, also it might be more challenging, right? The yeah. urgency is different. But we should do it for some other disease, right? So why not do the same thing for a few other diseases, right? Just do record setting bre breakthrough speed, right? And uh, Yes, you would need to break some people, right? So yes, if they want to have 30% vacation, well, sorry, maybe we'll need to get other people, right? I get people like me, right? I don't, I never took a vacation. Um, well, I took is, is one that, vacation, I think over 10 years, yeah. Do you think there's mm -hmm. like some uh, responsiveness of this, like let's say paradigm 
shift that you are calling for? How the, how's the resistance you're uh, sensing at this moment into like accelerating that outside of pandemic context? So I, I stopped arguing with people. <laughs> I don't uh, feel resistance because I'm not pushing anybody else. I'm pushing my own team, right? So uh, I have my company, I have uh, the resources, I have the investors, I have um, really amazing algorithms. Uh, and I'm also very focused on global collaborations. So I have uh, people in um, uh, North America, and Montreal, and uh, in, in New York. Uh, I have uh, people in uh, Europe, the Middle East. Uh, I have uh, a substantial number of people in uh, Asia, in Greater China, so in Shanghai, Suzhou, Hong Kong, Taipei. Um, uh, so we work globally 24-7, so we span every um, time zone. And uh, uh, in some areas, like again, greater China, you can move faster in many cases, right? So um, the Chinese government originally um, followed very similar approach as uh, the FDA, right? And then they actually decided to accelerate a little bit. So um, they probably are now at the same level of efficiency. So they're not, a, not more bureaucratic, uh, but in some cases, they are actually even faster, but I'm talking about maybe like 10, 15%. Uh, and we try to utilize every possible efficiency gain we can get to do things faster and also higher quality. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so we try to replicate many of our experiments in several different labs. So parallelize, and uh, we have usually triplicate or uh, at least duplicate data compared to wow. uh, what other biotech companies are doing. Uh, so we, we try to understand the mechanism of action, uh, toxicity, uh, side effects um, much, much better. And um, we try to parallelize a lot of processes uh, and replicate. So that uh, allows us to move faster Sometimes you get into trouble doing this because you know some party might not know that you are duplicating and they might think that you are pushing them to work hard and they are failing and uh, um, uh, you know they cannot deliver in, at the same yeah. pace, right? But you got the data from somewhere else and they later uh, are pretty um, annoyed by that, uh, disappointed, but uh, well, we, we do what we have to do, right? So I don't need to argue with the others. I just need to deliver myself. Yeah. So my job is to learn from Elon, right? So if he were to go and advocate for, oh, let's do electric cars, Ford needs to do electric cars. Well, <clears throat> unless you build it yourself, people don't believe you. Prove it, yeah. Uh, Dr. Zabaronkov, uh, your time is limited. Let me ask you this. Um, Final question, it will take hours to talk about everything you're doing. So this will be for another time. In your vision, uh, Insilico is part of a longer vision that you call the longevity pledge. One, let's say keyword or like part of this pledge just attracted my attention about cryonic, cry cryostasis or biostasis, sorry. Maybe in like few minutes, is that part of what Insilico is doing or is going to do, or this is a completely different approach or complementary thing? What's the role of it? So that's, uh, that's my personal initiative. It's not, has nothing to do with Insilico. Uh, so Insilico is of course the beating heart of uh, everything I do, but uh, uh, here I'm just doing my own uh, research on my own, at my own pace, uh, looking at the different ways to um, uh, to preserve biological uh, systems. Uh, and I don't, uh, it, it's just very strange that also very few people are doing good research in this area. Uh, there are a few centers of excellence globally, and I talked to many of them, interviewed them for Forbes.com. Uh, I sometimes uh, contribute there. Uh, and um, I think that this is very, deeply underexplored area because uh, we know that you know liquid nitrogen works 
uh, and you can freeze cells in specific solutions uh, and you can actually uh, recover human embryos, uh, implant them, and uh, they're going to come become healthy humans. But we cannot do this on large systems, uh, on uh, entire humans. But wouldn't it be great to be able to, uh, you know, preserve your body for a few years uh, until the cure is available? Or uh, if you are to do any kind of long-term travel, why not just you know go into biostasis and then come out, right? So you can do you can save uh, a lot of uh, world's resources just on travel by doing this. Uh, and um, I think that the fact that we are not looking into this area is pretty appalling, right? So uh, because people, I think that's actually need to. Um, uh, well, actually assign some level of blame to people who were promoting early cryogenic techniques, right? So basically uh, putting people into liquid nitrogen with yeah. a promise of future rejuvenation. And we know that it doesn't work, right? And so it didn't work so far. Creates resistance from public because I think it like it's, uh, seems like science fiction under explained for me, like it, a pragmatic approach and explanation is needed. In my opinion. Yeah, so uh, I think that, you know, people will continue doing this, right? They will be storing uh, human bodies in liquid nitrogen, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not against it, right? It's just we need to be able to explain to, again, Vox Populis, uh, what, uh, what they are doing, right? And uh, yes, currently it's uh, just an alternative to a religion, right? Because, yeah, well, you might wake up somewhere sometime, right? Uh, and uh, there is a promise. And if you believe in it, yeah. maybe, you know, something happens. But there is no evidence that it can, it can happen. Uh, so I think that what these companies need to do uh, and what uh, governments need to explore um, are new ways for biostasis, right? So I'm talking about novel gases, combination of different gas mixtures, novel cryoprotectants, novel, novel ways to uh, revive the uh, organic tissue out of uh, cryostorage. Maybe there are alternatives to low temperatures. Uh, so I'm looking at multiple approaches and currently just learning and supporting some teams, right? A little bit. But uh, I don't spend more than a few hours a week on the weekend on that. So still at an early phase. Can't wait to, to hear more uh, about it. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, more of your time. Um, as I mentioned, it will take hours to talk about everything, all the interesting things you're doing. I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zavoronkov. It's a real pleasure uh, for you being here. And yeah, talk to you later. Likewise. Let's get more people from IT into biotech. I think that, that's a very promising route. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, great, thanks.